All right. Um, and last but not least is Mark Gritter. Welcome to the stage. Hello. Uh, I'm going to be talking about procedurally generating economies with graph grammars and math. Uh, I like both. I like all of those. My introduction to roguelikes was NetHack on a PC. And one of the things I really loved was the shopkeepers. Uh, I played a lot of Elite 2 on my Commodore 64, which has trade as its focus and still does have that as a major component in its current version. Uh, I played a game called RPG Maker called Steward Smith's Adventure Construction Set. I sent, spent so much time building shops, I usually didn't finish building the adventures. Uh, Dwarf Fortress, of course, has trade too. But I have a lot of questions about what's going on here. Who buys all that junk you sell to shops and why? What does the merchant do with all the stone tableware your, fortune, your fortress sells them? And how the heck does an entire planet end up as agricultural? Uh, and fundamentally, most of all, does trade and the broader economy make it a difference in a game world or is it just decoration? So I'm gonna talk about my experience with a project called Emoji Economy. It builds toy economies through these four steps. Build a graph that represents a flow of items. Apply a utility function that has a decreasing ma marginal utility and sets the choices represented in that graph to maximize that utility, to maximize happiness. We create different regions, each with a copy of that graph, slightly altered to break or maybe specialize each region. And we find trade routes between regions that exchange goods and bring the utility back up. So here's a, an example of the sort of graph I'm talking about, not the one Lisa Simpson has made. Uh, you already got an example earlier. It has circles called nodes and arrows called edges, and each can have some label attached. Each node represents either a good, like the melon and lemon at the top, or a process that transforms the goods, like the alembic and the axe here. From an initial set of natural goods, like plants, the economy produces a variety of other consumables like pie at the bottom here. So in my prototype, I had just two types of transformations of goods. Factories that put two units together to create a single new unit, or processing plants that split a single unit into its component parts. So the sink of the graph represents consumption of goods by the population. We want as many goods as possible to, to be used. And in a graph like this, a good could have more than one possible use. We could eat a plant directly, uh, like this left, left, right hand uh, edge, or we could process it into beer. And this gives us some play in the economy. We have to make decisions rather than just everything flowing through the graph. In emoji economy, these graphs are produced with a graph grammar. And a graph grammar is a set of production rules that matches some set of labeled nodes and edges within a graph and makes an alteration. For example, on the left-hand side, I've illustrated a rule that takes a source and sink node and constructs a new plant in between them. So a new plant is grown and it's eaten directly. The right-hand side shows this being applied to an existing graph that already has some, some, uh, some flow. So Joris Dormans has used graph grammars to great effect in Unexplore. And the, the strength of a graph grammar is that it makes it easy to preserve structural invariance. So in a dungeon, the graph grammar knows not to move the key behind the door it opens. In a mode economy, we, we can ensure that inputs or outputs remain hooked up so that there aren't any consumable items just hanging out, out being unused. Here's an example of a, a moderately complex rule from Emoji Economy. It says if there's some good that's used by a factory um, and we have a token that allows us to use another plant product, then we create a new process which produces the same good as well as another byproduct not hooked up to anything. So another rule could use that or maybe convert it into a garbage type with negative utility. But this provides two ways of feeding that, that factory. So let's switch to talking about what, what's an economy look like besides a graph. So economists are favorite and, and game theorists are fond of utility, which is circularly defined as whatever people attempt to maximize. So we can think of it as happiness. And virtually any real good has diminishing marginal utility, which just means that the n plus one of it is not worth as much to you as the n. 
if you have 999 lemons, then the thousandth lemon really doesn't make all, you know, it doesn't help you a lot. So I modeled this as a sigmoid function, which asymptotically reaches some limit. So what have we got? We've got a set of choices about what to do with goods. In the simple graph here, we've got apples, which we could eat directly or make in a juice or use for apple butter. Uh, the constraint is our choices have to add up to 100%. We can't magically get more juice than we have apples. Um, and we've got a constraint we want to max maximize under those, a, a function we want to maximize under those constraints. But our objective on, that we saw on the previous slide is nonlinear, and so the effect of our choices. So we can't use an easy algorithm like linear programming. This is actually a, a tough problem. Um, the solution I picked is a standard method called gradient descent. Uh, I won't go into all this. A lot of the math looks abstruse, but it's really actually a very simple idea. Just move in the direction that makes things better. And if you end up making things worse, take smaller steps next time. Don't you know, sort of roll that back and don't do it. Uh, one problem I should mention is that we might, in following this best path, make the choices out to more, more than 100%. And the solution is just pull them back to the nearest point that does match the constraint. And there's a very cool and simple algorithm that does this, which is surprisingly was only invented in 2011. It was kind of far along our tech tree for some reason. But really, you know, there's a good point here, which is real economies are not perfect and your simulated economy doesn't have to either. I think it's actually cool if players notice that a suboptimal choice has been made, if they have the power to do something. So now that everything's working mostly like it should, we can start breaking the economy. Our perfect economy might fail in different ways. Maybe some regions can't grow apples. Maybe it lacks the infrastructure to make apple juice. And some of these differences, most of these differences, I think, can be simulated by removing parts of the original graph. That's what I did in Emojicon. This usually lowers the utility because there are not as many goods or you know, not as many choices in each region. So trade can repair some of the damage. The partially broken economies give some motivation to move goods back and forth. Uh, the simple Econ 101 version looks like this. A can make juice but not butter. B can make apple butter but not apple juice. If they trade equal amounts, both are better off. But there are two problems, one theoretical and one practical. So the theoretical problem is how do two negotiators come to an agreement? Maybe A demands more than its fair share. Should B give in just because there's some benefits better than none? Uh, economists develop several models, all of which disagree. And the bad news is that when we study real humans, uh, they don't behave in a way consistent with any of them. So who knows? And practically, this is a hard problem to identify all the good opportunities for trade. Is there any efficient way of doing so? So here's an algorithm I came up with that produces results that I think are okay. We just proceed in rounds. One region becomes the seller and says, hey, I have 100 limes. What have you got? Each other region makes an honest bid for the maximum they'll pay for those limes, maybe five video games or 16 slime molds or 200 yarn. And the seller reruns his bottle and says, okay, if I subtract my limes and add in the yarn, what does my utility look like? They pick the bid that maximizes their utility, or they just reject them all if the game is too small. So this produces, I think, realistic looking trades, but it's lots and lots of optimization runs. It's way too slow. The alternative is to pick trades randomly, use them if they're positive, and this is fast, but produces sort of weird results. So here's an example. We've got uh, sort of the on the left-hand side, we've got an optimally balanced economy that's perfect. On the right-hand side, we took uh, nine different regions and broke them all and ran this algorithm. And I, I like that we got a nice, dense network of trade with, with you know, things that are traded that make sense, but there's still a lot of variety going on. I'm your one-minute timer. All right. All the trades are bi-directional. There's no triangle trades, although they occur in real life. So there's, there's a lot of room to do better. I also ignored any cost of moving goods or geographic considerations. I think those could be added in and, and make interesting modifications to what you get as the output. So this code is available on GitHub under mgritter emoji economy. If you have any trouble, please let me know. My documentation's very poor. Uh, I based this on my old 
own graph grammar implementation called Sophit as an homage to tracery, uh, which has mainly failed in its design goals. So I'm looking forward to rewriting it, but I'll be giving a talk on it next Saturday as part of Minibar, my local unconference. That's it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll try and make sure those links get shared out. Excellent talk.